And now, Jyoti! Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jyoti Nanda. I teach here at the law school. This is my 12th year at the law school. I teach both in the Critical Race Studies program and the Public Interest Law program. And it's wonderful to see a lot of new faces in this room. So if you're from other parts of campus, welcome. Um, welcome to our law school students and welcome to the faculty and friends that are here today. You're really in for a treat. Um, I have the um, honor and privilege to introduce Dorothy Roberts today. I'm going to be very brief. Um, by way of introduction, she's the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor. To bear with me, she has a lot of titles. George A. Weiss University Professor and the inaugural Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mosel Alexander Professor of Civil Rights at the University of Pennsylvania, where she holds appointments in the law school and Department of Africana Studies and Sociology. So that would be three different. <laughs> Three different positions in case you're counting, um, which is, I know, very, very rare. Um, fifteen years ago, it's been almost fifteen years, a little more, I had the gift of having Dorothy Roberts as my first year from a law professor at Northwestern. I was in awe of her then as a student as I am now, not just because she was a terrific teacher, but because she helped me see the world differently and more clearly. I proceeded to take every class that she taught in my three years, and you'll see in a minute why that was. Professor Roberts is brilliant, and I say this in a room full of brilliance, in a building full of brilliance, but what is truly brilliant about Roberts, Professor Roberts, is that she takes concepts head on and gets us to see how wrong we are about the way we view them. <laughs> she has done this time and time again through her writing and through her teaching. In 1991, her article, Punishing Drug Addicts, who have babies, women of color, equality, and the right of privacy, which was published in the Harvard Law Review, was groundbreaking. I remember reading it as a student in ethnic studies at Berkeley. It has been widely cited and included in a number of anthologies. Her first book, Killing the Black Body in 1997, was released the year prior to me starting law school, when I was already working on children's issues. And I remember then, as I do now, how transformative it was among feminists, those who cared about child welfare, and those who cared about reproductive justice. Professor Roberts made a case in the book about how black women's reproductive capacity has consistently been used against them throughout American history as a means of race control and devaluation. She argued for a notion of reproductive liberty that recognizes race as an inherent reproductive rights issue, something that we continue to talk about today. The National Law Journal said about killing the black body, chilling. It becomes difficult to reject the author's thesis that there is, that there is a sustained and in some quarters, deliberate campaign to punish black women, especially the poor, for having children. Five years later, Professor Roberts wrote another transformative book called Shatter Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, that again rocked the child welfare movement. The year the book came out, I, I was a summer law clerk at the Children's Defense Fund in Washington, DC. And I can recall that the number one question that I got asked when I told them I was from Northwestern was, have you met Dorothy Roberts? <laughs> People had her book up on their shelves. And for those of you that are advocates in the room or who care about the issues, to have somebody name and call out what you've been working on is pretty transformative. They were in awe of her and how she had transformed the work they did about linking child welfare to race, reproductive rights, poverty, and history. She's a prolific <laughs> author, having co-edited six books on constitutional law and gender, published more than 80 articles and essays and books in scholarly journals, including Harvard Law Review, Lib Yale Law Journal and Stanford Law Review. She's been a professor at Northwestern, at Rutgers, a visiting professor at Stanford and Fordham, and a fellow at Harvard, Stanford, and was a Fulbright scholar. She serves on the board of the Black Women's Health Imperative and on the board of directors of various organizations about the issues that she cares deeply about. Today, the book that she's about to discuss with us is again trying to get us to see the world differently, Fatal Invention. The New York Journal of Books, in a review of the book, said, this is the best book of the year. If you read one work of nonfiction a year, make it this one. And with that, I want to thank Dorothy Roberts for both being here and for doing all that she does. And please join me welcoming her. I'll just leave now. <laughs> First your bubble. <laughs> that was so beautiful. And I am just so proud of Jyoti and what she's accomplished since 15 years ago. Wow. 
and then there's Beth Colgan, another one of my former students. And UCLA just seems to grab all the good ones <laughs> that I've trained. <laughs> I can't take credit for that. But uh, it's really wonderful to be here. I have so many friends at UCLA, and uh, thanks so much. And Cheryl Harris, thank you so much for the invitation to come to um, the Critical Race Studies program, lecture series, or whatever you call this. Or maybe it's just ad hoc. But, uh, <laughs> it's Dorothy's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Thanks to everybody. If I kept, kept naming names, we'd be here all night. So, um, I, uh, as Jyoti said, I, I want to uh, talk about my latest book project, uh, Fatal Invention, uh, and uh, the new biopolitics of race that I explain in, in that text. Uh, in 2000, when Bill Clinton unveiled the first map of the human genome. It wasn't completed uh, for three more years, but there was a draft of it that was finished in 2000. And when he unveiled it, he made a point to say that it showed that race does not exist at the genetic level. The way he said it was that in genetic terms, all human beings, regardless of race, are more than 99.9% .9 the same. I think he could have said it a little better, but uh, the point was that he and Francis Collins, who led the government, federal government uh, effort, and Craig Venter, who uh, had his own private genome map project going in competition with the federal government, uh, they all three made a point of saying that it showed that race is not an innate biological category. Interesting, I think, that all three of them thought it was necessary to make the point because so many people, you know, had not been convinced despite lots and lots of evidence that uh, it was not that a political category. Uh, we know that race was invented for political reasons. Um, around the time that Europeans began to enslave and colonize and take the land of uh, and torture and all the rest, people of color and other parts of the world, uh, the way to manage that was to divide people up by race. So you could identify who were the people who could enslave others, the Europeans, and who were the people who could be enslaved. and different categories in between, and they invented, European typologists, a classification system that mapped onto uh, the hierarchy, social hierarchies that they were creating. So you know, first came the desire to enslave and conquest or racism, and then came race. We needed race in order to manage and justify racism. Uh, and just to emphasize that what Bill Clinton was saying wasn't anything new, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, had written about the way in which the categories we call race and the consequences of categorizing people by race that leads to all sorts of inequities, that those were natural inequities race didn't create, naturally produce inequities in health, Du Bois identified back in 1899 that those inequities were caused by racism, by the social inequalities. Inequities of health were caused by the social inequalities. And so he said that uh, the reason why Negroes have consumption uh, isn't because they're naturally predisposed to consumption. Uh, it used to be the Irish who were seen as naturally predisposed to consumption, but he says, but that's when they were unpopular. He says, it's the unpopular people who are have the fate of being diseased and having higher rates of all sorts of problems not because they're innately predisposed to be that way. 
But no sooner had we seen what seemed now to be finally the definitive determination that race wasn't a biological category, then people like Nicholas Way <coughs> reported that the next phase of the Human Genome Project wasn't a new way of thinking about human beings divorced from race, biological race, understanding that the inequalities that we see are not natural, and also thinking about for purposes of understanding the biology of human beings, a different way of classifying them, <laughs> necessary to classify them even. Uh, you, know, you, you might think that Nicholas Wade, in writing about the Human Genome Project, would say scientists planning the next phase of the Human Genome Project are being forced to confront the issue of a new way of thinking about human genetic diversity, for example. But no, he said, are being forced to confront the treacherous <laughs> issue, the genetic differences between human beings. So I started reading articles like this. I mean, Wayne was responsible for a whole lot of them. But you know, he's writing in the New York Times. You know, he's not writing in the White Supremacist Review. Because, you know, this is the New York Times. It's supposed to be accurate, right? And, and liberal, and uh, write about important things. And Wade is writing some of these articles on the front page of the New York Times talking about the principal human races and how understanding the genetic differences between them is the most important scientific <laughs> project, you know, facing human kind. Uh, now, recently, uh, he, he was, those articles were coming out as soon as the human genome was mapped, he recently expanded all of this in a book called The Troublesome Inheritance, Genes, Race, and Human History, where he extends this whole theory of uh, human races being created through natural selection, and, uh, and that they're responsible not only for physical differences between races, but also social differences, and that different races are genetically predisposed to create different types of institutions. And the reason why Europeans are more advanced is because they're genetically predisposed to be creative and innovative and peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> Asians are genetically predisposed to conforming because they like authoritarian regimes. And Africans are genetically predisposed to be tribal. And that's why Africa is a country, of, a country. Well, he, that's yeah. what, that's what I'm, thinking. I'm thinking as Nicholas Wade would think. A continent of uh, people who are violent and tribal and chaotic. Uh, I, I only have limited time, so I will not go up. By the way, I do have a review of this coming out in Du Bois Review, in the next issue of Du Bois Review. But um, I'll just say one thing that annoys me so much about his book is you, he completely ignores the history of slavery, of conquest, you know, of slaughter, extermination by Europeans. And not only does he ignore it, he says that proof of African tribalism is that when the Europeans left Africa, they benevolently tried to give Africans democratic institutions, but Africans reverted, I literally, I'm quoting, reverted to their tribal natures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's how their genes predetermined that. Now, the book was criticized soundly by many, many reviewers, but interestingly, mostly for these really crazy speculative things he says, a lot 
of what he said about the evolution of separate races is doesn't get any criticism or you know very mild criticism. Okay. And you know, this was published by Penguin Books, I'm pretty sure, you know, by a reputable publisher in 2014. All right, now let's talk about a good book. <laughs> Anticipation of Nicholas Wade's <laughs> book. Uh, really, he, his articles in the New York Times were a big motivator. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, the, in the book, I identify a new uh, politics of race that I say is composed of three parts. One is this new racial science that defines race as a genetic grouping. Secondly, biotech and pharmaceutical industries are developing race specific products that are not actually based on any evidence of this racial science, but based on the ideas and concepts of race. Uh, so they market products based on a concept that races are genetically distinct and therefore uh, you need different medications for different races, different technologies that are suited to different races. These are gene-based technologies. And this is all going on in a context, a social political context, in which we have persistent racial inequality, increasing state violence. I mean, I, this book was published in 2011, and I have uh, a lot about uh, mass incarceration and torture of people, uh, people of color in prisons and, and police brutality and all this. This is all before uh, the explosion uh, that we're seeing of police killings around the country. So, you know, more and more evidence I could add every day to the kind of brutality, race-based brutality that we're seeing in this country. And um, that is the context in which we're seeing this resurgence of the idea that races are innately uh, different uh, at the genetic level, and that that genetic difference explains differences in health, but also in behavior. So let me just uh, give you some evidence of this uh, resurgence of the genetic definition of race and how it's being used in biotechnology and some of the arguments that are being made about it. So this definition of race as a population cluster based on genetic differences due to evolutionary pressure is basically, Nick, this is Nicholas Wade's uh, argument. I think I've got, yes, a quote from a troublesome inheritance. Ever since the first modern humans dispersed from the ancestral homeland in Northeast Africa, you know, populations on each continent involved independently of one another, adapting to their own regional environments. Uh, so this idea that populations on each continent were independent, I would like to know when in human history this was, that this span where you could have a population evolve to have different social uh, traits producing different institutions independently of each other. When in human history was this? Where are the divisions? You know, because by the way, you know, Europe and Asia are on the same continent, really, it's the same landmass. So where are these splits? And then, of course, what do you do with the problem of human beings mixing with each other, you know, and that the definition of race has nothing to do with any of this. It's just a made-up definition that takes into, you know, that decides what mixtures count and which ones don't. And so I will just leave you to, you know, again, I don't have time to pick apart every single word here, but you can see that this is their problems with this very basic definition of race, but also note that in scientific journals, scientists are using the same definition, the same concept of what race means. OK, 
Okay, and just some examples that we see in major media outlets way talking about the gene that produces East Asian traits that makes them different from other races. Uh, in the BBC last October, reporting about a skeleton, 45,000 year old skeleton, but then commenting that it's genetically midway between Europeans and Asians. Okay, so Europeans are a genetically distinct group from uh, Asians, and we can identify you know, these groups by genes. And, it, and you know, this has all the ideas of race, that everybody in the race is similar enough to each other to distinguish them from everybody in every other race, and they're different. They're, they're similar to each other and different enough from everybody else. Uh, and this includes all Europeans and all Asians, right? That fall into these groups. Uh, and that he lived close to the time before our species separated into different <laughs> racial groups. So again, the same theory that you know, they have at least rejected Samuel Morton's theory of independent species. You know, that blacks, whites, Asians, Native Americans were independent species that were created separately. But it's not that far from that. It's just that this happened at some point in human history later on. Uh, Peter Chow White and Sandy Green uh, conducted a study of 464 scientific articles published between 1998 and 2007, and they did a content analysis of uh, those that, these are uh, scientific articles that deal with race and genomics in some way. And they did a, their content analysis, they distinguished between articles that treated race as a, RR as racial realists, as a real genetically determined category, and social constructionists. And the top is racial realists. They found a huge explosion in the number of articles where the scientists treated race as a genetically determined category and not as a socially determined category. And note that it happens after this, this big gap happens after the mapping of the human genome project. So you have scientists with all this new genetic information and what do they do with it? They increasingly divide it up by race. Okay, I just can't help myself. <laughs> this is so preposterous that I have to. But again, this is a study reported on the front page of the Science Times in the New York Times with the headline, Genome Study Points to Adaptation in Early African Americans, and this big portrait of enslaved people working in the fields, the white slaveholders in the background, and a new environment apparently brought genetic change. This study claims that the reason why African Americans have high rates of certain visit cancers and uh, heart disease. And people living in West Africa don't have those high rates. <laughs> it's not because of conditions in the United States, racism in the United States. No, it's because their genes evolved during the time <laughs> between coming, being brought to the U.S. and today, I mean, it's just almost hard to, so here's a quote. Certain disease-causing variants became more common in African Americans after their ancestors reached American shores, perhaps because they conferred greater offsetting benefits. This is the theory. It's used over and over again because just it seems so implausible that you 
would have this big social group that would have such bad outcomes, <laughs> and that, that, that they would naturally evolve to have higher rates of infant mortality, higher rates of mortality from breast cancer, higher rates of hypertension, higher rates of diabetes. How would natural selection have produced that? And so the theory is, well, there's some unknown benefit that black people get from having these genes. Well, you know what it comes from? It comes from, there's no saying, well, it sucks sickle cell anemia. It protects against malaria. That, that's the idea. But, you know, you have to ask, why doesn't it just operate with other groups of people? Like the slaveholders in the back. They also were facing this new environment. It was a more different environment for them. They were coming, you know, from England. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> But why didn't they evolve to have higher rates of these same diseases? Why just people of African descent? Okay. Let me move on to what's being done with this idea of biological race reducing these grave differences between the races. In 2005, the Food and Drug Administration approved the first race-specific drug, a drug called Bido, which is a therapy to treat heart failure. And uh, to make a long story short, Bido became a race-specific drug, a drug for black people for commercial reasons. This drug was developed by a cardiologist in Minnesota. It had nothing to do with race. It vital works because it expands the blood vessels. It's a, what they call a vasodilator. And that makes it easier for the heart to pump blood. So if you're suffering from heart failure, you're more likely to survive because it relieves the stress on the heart. And he developed it for any human being. <laughs> you know, who's who has blood vessels, basically, <laughs> right? who has a heart. <laughs> I mean, he, he, I've talked, he did not, develop, his first patent had, they made no mention of race whatsoever. The FDA, well, I can't go into all the details, but the FDA would not approve the drug based, because he had not conducted a new clinical trial. And so time had gone on. His, his patent was going to expire. He needed a new patent with a novel claim. And so he added the same formula for the drug. Nothing changed. He added that it was a drug for African Americans. The FDA told him if you conduct a clinical trial using African Americans, and it works on African Americans, <laughs> we may approve it for African Americans. Mm -hmm. So there was this big, large clinical trial. Only African Americans were participants in the trial. And it worked. <laughs> survival, <laughs> you know, huge improvement in survival versus the um, control group. They stopped the study and the FDA approved it for African Americans. Now, on what grounds? The uh, chair of the advisory committee said, we're using self-identified race as a surrogate for genetic markers. They made up a theory, because he was a cardiologist. He was not a geneticist. The genes had nothing to do with this drug, and including the original clinical trial. It, it was not about genes, it was just whether it worked, you know, on people with heart failure. And they, they made this up, that there must be a genetic reason why black people suffer more from heart failure. And then the push for Bido was if you care about black people <laughs> and heart failure, you're going to want Bido because this is a drug that finally has the federal government concerned about black people's health. This is how it was pushed. And yeah, I, I'm, well, I'll tell you, let's see if I start telling stories, we'll be here too late, but I have to, I'll tell you. I was at a conference once, because before I wrote my book, I'd just written an article about Bido, and a, um, was at, uh, at MIT, 
And the Massachusetts, the guy who was the head of the Massachusetts uh, NAACP, I'm sorry, I have to say, I have, this is the truth, I have to say it. I mean, we all love the NAACP, but he came in with people from Nitrovet, the company that uh, manufactured it. And they had a contract with that company to help promote it in the black neighborhood. And when I questioned this drug, he got up and started shouting and yelling at me that I was risking the life of black people. <laughs> I swear to you. Money. Because money. You know what? After that, I called up a friend of mine. I said, you wouldn't believe what just happened to me. I can't believe this. This man was shaking and screaming at me. And he said to me, my friend said to me, who's paying you? That's exactly what my friend said. Hey, I better stop this being recorded. I don't want to be NAACP. But I think they were, I think people were mistaken. They were mistaken about whether or not the best way to address the, the huge, staggering gaps in health uh, is through some kind of special pharmaceutical for black people. Um, I would say if you want to shrink that gap, which is mostly a gap of young people, if the gap is produced because young black people, especially young black men, are dying from heart failure at rates that are much higher than white people of that age. And so I would say, you know, look, instead of doing research into genes, do research into how being stopped by the police, <coughs> being shot at by the police, being harassed by the police, knowing that 50% of the young men in your neighborhood are going to prison, right? That is how you deal with heart failure in the black community. Stop that. Don't look for a gene that determines it. Okay. Let me move on. Other technologies. Ancestry testing. Now, there are two main kinds. One is, uh, these are mostly online companies. You send them. Some of you may have participated in this. You send them a, a, a saliva sample, usually. And uh, they, can, they say they can tell you what race you are. And this is based on definitions of race, like the one I mentioned, that, that races are genetically distinct groupings so that we can test your race based on your genes. Um, which, you, you, how could you know what somebody's race is if you don't know how the society they're living in at the particular time defines their race? How could you, you can know what their genes are, but you don't know you, you even, you know, to, to test an African, somebody who has African ancestry, you don't know what race they are unless, you know, you're in a country that says if you have any African ancestry, you're black. Or a country that might say you need a certain amount. Or like the United States used to say, there's a certain amount. You know, if you, have, if you don't have a whole lot, we might call you white. Right? That's how it used to be. It, and it's, it would vary by state. So knowing the genes, you'd have to know what state am I in in the United States to know what race I am. And then another uh, type of, of uh, genetic testing service looks at, uh, traces your ancestry to a particular tribe or uh, in Africa or uh, Jewish tribe or Native American tribe are the main ones. They're also uh, some Celtic tribes you can trace your ancestry to. And um, so these make your identity rooted in genetics. Uh, Kim Tall Bear, uh, who has a, a relatively new book out now called Native American DNA, uh, argues that with respect to Native Americans, saying that your membership in a tribe depends on your genes is a 
actually challenges and, and threatens the political and cultural foundation of Native American identity. And she argues that the idea of blood quantum, that you know how Native American you are, depends on what used to be called blood or your your genetic ancestry, that that came from the federal government, that was imposed on Native Americans. Uh, and so there's controversy about <laughs> the politics of these testing companies. All right, so that's just a touch, <laughs> a little hint of the kinds of definitions of race and the kinds of technologies that are based on this genetic definition of race. Now, uh, one response to this, particularly by liberals, uh, and many of these scientists who are doing this research, I'd say probably most of them, would consider themselves to be liberal scientists who are interested in racial equality. And their argument is, let us do this science. Just don't let it get in the hands, as Esteban Richard said, of people like David Duke, you know, the, the former KKK grand wizard. Uh, if, if they can be used for good, like Bidel, which gave drugs, you know, pharmaceuticals to black communities, it failed, by the way, because I think the reason it failed was because the government wouldn't cover it. It was so expensive. Oh, I forgot to mention, Bible is just a combination of two generic drugs that have been prescribed for over 20 years. <laughs> you know, it's not like some new formula just for black people. It's, it's two generic drugs. And so the government's position was, we're not going to cover Bible that costs, I think, seven times as much as just prescribing the two generic drugs. And it, it ended up um, blocking. Um, but uh, that was the, you know, so, but many people, as I said, thought that was a good way to deal with health inequities. Uh, so there are good uses of it, just don't let it get in the hands of people who use it to say that uh, people of certain races are less intelligent, for example, or you know, prone to crime. As long as we use it for good, it's all right. Now, one problem with that is that this is not good science. You know, as I've as maybe perhaps you've seen me allude to this already in this talk, that uh, treating a social category as if it were a genetic category is not good science. You're misusing the cat as an important variable in your research. So I'll just give you uh, one example of a study that was trying to explain high rates of preterm birth, which is a major explanation for um, gaps, uh, gaps in infant mortality. You know, but black people in America have always had two to three times the rate of infant mortality of whites. And to this day, the persistent uh, staggering, and we're talking about chilled babies who die in the first year of life. And so they were trying to uh, find out why, and their hypothesis was that black race, independent of other factors, increases the risk of extreme preterm birth and its frequency of occurrence. Black race causes. What, what does that even mean? What, do, what is black race, independent of other factors? And how, whatever it is, how does it cause anything? Uh, independent of anything else. And what they're saying here is that there's something innate in black people that's independent of social factors. You know, this is not about high rates of poverty. This is not about black people's experiences. This is not about lack of access to health care. This is just about black race, like the essence of blackness that produces, somehow produces these negative outcomes, even deaths of infants. No, the hypothesis is, is strange, but they don't define what they mean by black race. They don't define how they determine who belong to the black race in their study. And then the, 
brain which they come back to the site, they control for a few factors, welfare receipt, wig receipt, uh, as representing all the social factors that could possibly cause this higher rate of future birth. They found that controlling for these few factors, not surprisingly, there still was this gap. And so they conclude that this suggests a probable genetic component that may underlie <coughs> the public health problem presented by the racial disparity in preterm birth. I think that that conclusion is unsupported by the evidence that they collected in the study. So just one example, but it, you know, it was published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology and also got a headline in the New York Times up here because study points to genetics and disparities in preterm birth. This is one indicator that you must always go back and look at the study because you read this headline and you would think that there was a study that actually showed that genetics is the reason that black people have higher rates of preterm birth. When I don't think the study showed that at all. Okay, so does race have some relationship to health? Yes, it does, but not because of genetic difference. It does because it helps to determine people's experiences depending on what race they're identified as. <laughs> and so it's the impact of social inequality on people's health that makes the difference. I mean, I would say it's not race, it's racism that is the cause for these uh, inequities in health. Okay, another response is, don't worry, be patient, <laughs> just wait. And this is, I call, this is a genetic counselor who came to a talk I gave on um, the biological, the problems with using a biological category of race in um, genetic research. And she said, I agree with you, race is a crappy proxy for genetic variation, but it's the best tool we have now. And you know, my response was, why do you want to treat your patients using a crappy proxy? <laughs> Let's look, we think of a better one than race, but then you get this response very often. It's the best we have now, but it's going to change. And it's going to change with precision medicine. It's Barack Obama announced this in the State of the Union address, uh, uh, $200 million, which actually isn't that much money <laughs> for a medical initiative, but it's a start uh, that we are going to start using what used to be called personalized medicine, precision medicine, that is tailored to individuals, uh, genotype, and other aspects, but genes make a, are a big part of this. And the idea is, as uh, David Goldstein Said, um, he called up, in a, uh, he's a, a well-known uh, genome scientist, and um, I was talking on a radio show once, and he called up and he said, well, we're going to, when we roll out personalized medicine, we won't be using race anymore in medical practice and biomedical research. Uh, this is similar to uh, comments made by um, people involved in producing the gene-based products, that they're going to create a new community where race doesn't matter anymore because we will identify people at the genetic level. We will be treated, we'll associate with people according to our genes. And so just hold on. Don't get all excited you know, about this resurgence of biological race it's going to disappear soon. Of course, that's what they said back in 2000 when they unveiled the human genome uh, map. And you know, here we are in 2015, and we have, we're just seeing an increase, an increase in the use of race as a biological category. Also, when the FDA uh, approved FIDAL, they said it was a step toward the promise of personalized medicine. Uh, there is a whole field of pharmacogenomics that is race-based, called uh, pharmacoethnicity. 
this is not being produced because it's the most scientifically accurate way of, of producing these drugs. It's because, as I pointed out with Michael, it's commercially advantageous. And if it's commercially advantageous, it, it will be commercially advantageous with precision medicine as well. It's not, it, it doesn't make sense commercially to produce drugs for individual people. That's not what precision medicine, <laughs> precise medicine is going to do. These are drugs that are going to be produced you know, in large numbers, and then the doctor will prescribe it to you according to what the doctor thinks is personalized for you. But doctors are trained to treat patients by race. And companies are used to promoting products by race. Health, healthcare products. And Vida was the first to be approved by the FDA, but there's a whole lot of products that are prescribed according to race. The Tums even used to have <laughs> something about race on the make. You know, you take a certain number if you're in one race. And this is so <laughs> embedded in medical practice. I mean, I. I could give a whole other lecture on, and I do, on the way in which medical practice uses race in ways that are even beyond the control of the doctor. I put technologies that have a race button, the spirometer that measures lung capacity. There's a button that says race that you're supposed to push so that the reading comes out differently depending on the race of the patient. And I, I could go on and on. So it's embedded in medical practice. I am not at all convinced that we are going to see race just magically disappear from this because it's, it's just the way it's going to roll out. Okay. Um, and then the, the final response is, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, because we live in an advanced liberal democracy. <laughs> and all those horrible things that happened during the eugenics era wouldn't happen now. Uh, this is about having more control over your life, not the government having control over you. So are we beyond eugenics? Well, Right here in California, it was recently revealed that women in California state prisons were being sterilized illegally. Uh, and the head of the program, and you know, it was a gender based, it's, this was supposed to be a gender sensitive program. Uh, just, so part of it was to avoid, as the head of that, of the program said these unwanted children that taxpayers would have to pay for. Um, we are living in a regime of privatization where welfare, and I mean broadly, well, the welfare state is shrinking with greater and greater reliance on market the market to provide for people and if you can't make it on the market then you are much more likely to be locked up because at the same time that we have the shrinking we've got an explosion of mass incarceration so I think we do need to be worried I don't think we can rely on living in a liberal democracy to be relieved that this biological definition of race and all the implications of that could not produce the kinds of policies and programs that were produced during a eugenicist era. And if we have many of those policies and programs exist right now, and we actually in many ways have greater inequality than we have that. Uh, one aspect of this punitive approach to uh, dealing with people who can't make it on the market 
uh, is genetic surveillance, which in California, man, you all passed a law here. It's like the model <laughs> where you could collect DNA from children, collect DNA from people who are only arrested. Um, and uh, huge DNA databases of people involved in the criminal justice system. And not surprisingly, uh, these, these are statistics that were estimated in 2006 and 2011, um, hugely disproportionately African Americans are, have their DNA in these in these law enforcement databases. Now, um, at the same time that we have this growing biological definition of race, mass incarceration, they, databases disproportionately filled with black and Latino people's uh, genetic information. Uh, there is also research coming out that is claiming to show, as Nicholas Wade argues, you know, he, he does cite studies in his book. It's not like he, it's, he says it's, he admits it's speculative. But he finds studies to cite, recent studies, because there are researchers that are conducting this kind of research. And, um, one of those studies that looks at behavior uh, that's caused by genes or associated with genes, fair associated with genes, is uh, violent behavior, uh, including gangbang, which is interesting because that you know gangbang is a it, how can you separate that from the social aspects? It's that it's not violence, it's gang -based. a particular type of violent behavior. <laughs> you know, we can find violent behavior in lots of people that are, don't go on to gangs, but this research is interesting in gang -based. Um, that is uh, associated with particular um, uh, MAOA gene. And this is the way that the Associated Press presented the research, uh, which incorporates not only racial stereotypes about who is violent, but also has this message about what to do with these people, which is cage them, right, and, and keep them uh, controlled by armed guards. So, um, at this, so, at the, so as we see this resurgence of the argument that race is a biological trait and the inequities along racial lines are caused by biological difference, we also see the popularity of an ideology that says that race is not important in society because racism has ceased. Either racism has ceased or we shouldn't care about it. And some commentators are putting these two together. They are explicitly saying that social race is just constructed. It's not important. It's biological race that really matters. Uh, Sally St. Teller, conservative psychiatrist who boasted about how she died. She treats her psychiatric patients differently depending on where she was in different doses of psychotropic drugs. Um, okay, another, but let, let me, Charles Murray in response is praising, I mean, you could imagine he's the co author of the bell curve, praised Nicholas Wade's book. But what I found interesting in this Wall Street Journal review of it was not that I expected him to praise Nicholas Wade's book, but he also articulates, articulates this idea that 
political struggle around race is not important. What's important is the biological differences. That's what we should be focusing on. So he says, um, the Amer America's violent struggle with race is preceded on three fronts. There was the legal battle that ended with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Okay, we, that's over and done with. We have civil rights in the United States. We don't have to worry anymore, right, about fighting for racial justice in America. That's done with. Okay, the second is expressions of racial pop, uh, prejudice. Again, you know, right, critical race theorists are all over this, right? The, this idea that all that, that's left now is individuals' racial bias. Uh, but you don't have to worry about that because if you say something racist, you're going to be kicked out, you know, out of your job. And so uh, we've, so we've dealt with that too. So what's important? Then? What's this third front? The third front is the idea that biological differences among human populations are a legitimate subject of scholarly study. That's what's important about race today. This is what we should be focusing on. And we should be attacking the reigning intellectual orthodoxy that race is a social construct, a cultural artifact without biological merit. So we're seeing this logic that racial differences are real at the molecular level, but merely constructed in society. You know, that all oh, it's a social constructionism, according to this view, is it's just the interpretation of biological difference, which is what's really important. And genetic race is scientific truth. Anti-racism is ideology, which is interfering with science. <laughs> So, I would say this is going in the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, social hierarchies are facts of nature. You know, I'm focusing on race, but, you know, in my talk earlier, I talked about disability, uh, gender, you know, all, all the hierarchies that are socially constructed, I mean, this is what they really are. I don't mean socially constructed, like it doesn't matter. That's what they are. They, that's what has an impact on our lives. That's what creates the suffering and the disadvantage. But the, the, the idea here is that those are, no, those are created by differences in biology, and the way to address them then is through biological interventions, like by technological fixes, and if those don't work, if you can't find a drug to cure gangbanging, then got to lock them up. <laughs> There's no alternative. Uh, I will end with the way I think we should see things, which is we should affirm our shared humanity by working to end the social inequities that are preserved by the political system of race. I will end there, and we, I hope we have a little time. I'm sorry I went over, but a little time for questions and answers. Okay, thank you. Wonder. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts about attention. Yeah. Um. And I, I, I don't. I, I'm. You know, bring this however you want. Yeah. Obviously, but um. It, it seems to me like how can this be anything else but intentional on the parts of these educated people? You know that these viewpoints. Yeah. That's that's. Yeah. I don't know how to yeah. frame that. I think that there are various motivations. Um, should I start from the, <laughs> the least disturbing to the most disturbing, maybe? I mean, I'll, I'll do it that way. I think some people misunderstand what race is. Mean, look, race is confusing to many, many people. Um, and 
for many people, it doesn't even get to the point of confusion because they haven't thought about it. I mean, I, I teach in elite schools, and I teach this subject to students. I have had students in law school say to me, this is the first time I thought about race. Literally. <laughs> and I, in fact, one said, um, I, I, well, actually, back in high school, we once did an exercise. You know, so there are many, many people who don't think about the meaning of race. Why is that? Because we are all taught and taught differently, but everybody is taught very early on about how important race is. And for many people, it just seems natural by the time they become adults because they think that they can just see it. They think it's just obvious. You know, I, I get that, re that very response often. Well, what are you talking about? I can see race. It's obvious on people's bodies. And so they, they haven't thought about it. thought about the inconsistencies, the, the, um, the nonsensical nature of some of the things that we think about race. Um, and so that's part of the reason. They're taught. So, you know, medical students, I, I speak to a lot of medical students, many have said to me, Professor Roberts, I used to, the, what you just said, wow, I used to think that until I got to medical school. And then I was taught that as soon, the first thing I do when I look at a patient is determine the patient's race, because that's going to determine how I diagnose their symptoms, and that's going to determine what medication I prescribe to them. And so, and they and some others said to me, that's going to determine whether I think they're going to take their medication or not because black people don't comply. I had a doctor <laughs> say that to me in the shock once. And in fact, I had a doctor say, well, why is it that, that my, I know all my black patients don't comply? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so they're taught that, you know, so at various stages, you know, as infants all the way to professionals. So part of it is just, you know, I think an ignorance or misunderstanding. Um, then there are the commercial forces. I think many of these researchers who are, um, who, as you said, have access to all this information, they're highly educated. I think for some of them, it's that if they can produce a, pharma, a drug, they can make a whole lot of money off of it. Whereas all the things I suggested you need to do, you know, to cure, the shrink the gap in infant mortality, and shrink the gap in heart failure, and all of that, and shrink the gap in asthma, you have to make major changes, social changes that are difficult to do, and it's hard to convince people that they can make money off of it. I mean, we could imagine new industries created to clean up the environment and uh, provide high quality health care to everybody, you know, and abolish prisons. You know, we could figure out how to do that, but it probably is going to cost something and it's not going to make as much money as a blockbuster drug. And I think Many people, and I don't want to say everybody, you know, you don't want to judge people's motives. I don't know people's hearts, but just things people have said to me and, and what in my interviews of scientists, and also you read articles, you read articles about new genetic um, discoveries, and look and see if at the end it doesn't mention the drug that's going to be produced as a result, you know. It's so often happens. And pharma, the pharmaceutical industry is sometimes the most profitable industry. It's usually the first, second, or third most profitable industry in the world. So I think that has a lot to do with it, too. And then there are those people who have you know, evil motives. 
you know, who do not want to see racial equality or any other kind of equality in America or around the world. They want to preserve white privilege. And the way, part of the way to preserve that is to convince people that the reason why white people have privilege is because they are innately superior. That is in Nicholas Way in his book, he says, I'm not a racist. Racism is believing that there is a superior race that uh, is entitled you know, to dominate other people. I'm just saying that white people have genetic advantages that make their institutions you know, succeed. And, and black people just happen to have evolved to have tribal genes. I, you know, I, I'm not judging. <laughs> judging. I'm not saying one is superior to the other or has the right to dominate another. But um, but believe me, there were white supremacists who took what he said and they interpreted it that way. But I think that what he, that distinction he makes is just it's lame. You know, it's just, it's just, there's no moral difference between the two. So I would put him, even though he tries to defend against it. I would put him in that third category, along with all the people that are using his arguments to defend white supremacy explicitly, explicitly. And there's probably other, but those are the three big categories I've seen of why people um, can continue to do this kind of research. Uh, and you know, I will point out in my book and also in my review of Way, it's not just conservatives. It's it's also liberals. It's even people who would call themselves progressive. Uh, and that this this hold of believing in innate racial difference, boy, it's strong. It's, I I think of it as getting some people who are deeply religious to just try not to believe in God. <laughs> it's, it's really, that's really hard to do if you've been trained to believe in God. You know? Like, I don't know if I could not believe in God. I'll just be honest. So I can, that's how I think about people who just cannot give up this idea that race is innate. So I'm curious about whether or not um, there's any uh, interventions into medical school curricular practices around this, and more specifically still, yeah. whether uh, doctors of color, black doctors, uh, they you know swallow the pill as it were, I mean, do they, <laughs> uh, around these kind yeah. of approaches to race at all? Is there any pushback uh, in uh, their own practices or the scholarly sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there there are other scholars who they I, I don't find them so much to be in, in medical practice, but in um, uh, genomic scholars who have written against the biological definition of race. Although not a lot, not a lot. I mean, it, it's really troubling to me that there isn't somebody thinks is it more of an outcry. So there were, for example, um, a hundred about 150 genomic scientists, evolutionary biologists, you know, various types of scientists who study genes and human population, who wrote a letter to the New York Times. Uh, in response to review of Nicholas Waite's book, saying that they um, were disturbed that they used their research to reach the speculative arguments about racial superiority and inferiority, to paraphrase. 
But they did not come out and say he was wrong about his view of the evolution of separate races. They only said he was wrong to get to that way speculative stuff about social institutions being different and blacks being tribal and all of that. Now, why, why wouldn't they do that? Well, they probably could not have gotten 150 of them to sign it if they made a statement against it, because some of them are doing the research. Then he signed, as I said, he's, he didn't just make it up. He found studies to sign it. And some of them are looking into genetic differences between races that they would say we're doing it to improve people's health, black people, you know, people, minorities' health. That's what they, they often add that to their art articles. Okay, so um, I would like to see more, more, you know, when Wade was publishing all of that in the New York Times for 10 years of talking about the principal human races and all of that, where were the editors? You know, why did, why did they let it be published? But if, if they were going to let it, why didn't they, why weren't there, you know, opposition to it in the New York Times also? So, um, I think it could be stronger. Um, in terms of medical practice, though, there is a move um, among medical schools to, to address this, but it's usually, you know, and I know there's because I get invited all the time to come. And what it is is come and talk to the incoming class about race. And they'll have somebody come in and talk about gender. Somebody can come in and talk about the social inequality. And the problem is they'll hear that, the, you know, the new medical students hear the talk. And then that's it in, in many places for the rest of their medical education. And the rest of the medical education then is telling them to pay attention <laughs> to the very thing, <laughs> to you know, racial differences. So that's the question of how these courses, but you know, we all know about the, the courses that it's an add-on. You know, it's an hour lecture that's supposed to address years of future education that tells them something different. Um, I'll tell you about one, uh, that, but that's so, some of them do try to integrate it more throughout, but you have to deal with these contradictions that the students are, are, are have to deal with. Because I've had students come up to me and say, well, what am I supposed to do? We are hearing from people like you, but when I take my exam, I have to, <laughs> answer the way that I was taught, and I was taught to take race into account as a, you know, as a biological category. Okay, let me just mention one um, hopeful, I think, <laughs> development, which is uh, the University of Texas is building now its first medical school on the Austin campus. And um, a group of uh, scholars who are writing about race and genetics um, organized a conference that we hope will have some influence on the new curriculum that will be taught at this new medical school. And some of the people uh, who were involved in this are professors Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know if he's in the medical, will be in the medical school, but uh, in evolutionary biology and anthropology and that kind of thing, public health. Um, and so it, it would be a great example if it works, but it's not clear how much influence this group is going to have, the symposium will have. Um, there's also a, uh, uh, an approach called structural competency that uh, was developed by uh, uh, Jonathan Metzl at, at Vanderbilt um, and um, Helena of the back, because I can't, her last name is escaping me now, at NYU. Um, 
And they've been promoting this in, in uh, articles and lectures um, that to replace cultural competency. Because the way in which doctors are taught to deal with racial difference, which they are taught is biological and cultural, is to be more competent uh, in their understanding of the different cultures of people of different races. This is often turned into teaching students stereotypes about people of different races. And structural competency look at uh, understands inequities in health as being created by structures as opposed to by either biology or culture. So that's, a, I cannot tell you whether or not that is having actual influence on the way um, doctors are being taught or practiced, but uh, there are these inroads. It's just that we're talking about a long history of race medicine in the United States, you know, all the way back to slavery, where the, the, you have these foundations of a whole ideology about medicine that people of different races have different diseases and experience disease differently. And the reason why black people have worse health is not because they're enslaved, because slavery is good for their health. You know, Samuel Cartwright wrote, slavery is good for black because it helps them vitalize their blood in those special blood vessels that black people have. <laughs> I mean, these ideas go away. Like, why is it so easy to believe that black people have different kind of blood vessels and they need a special drug for heart? Because no, that idea has been circulating for hundreds of years. And why is it so easy for doctors to push a race button on a spirometer to measure blood capacity? Because that idea has been circulating since slavery to explain why you have to work, you know, African people, because if you didn't coerce them, they're sort of innately lazy, and their lungs were, in, were weaker and couldn't vitalize the blood. So you had to enslave them. They were being carpenters and slaves. They were free. Black people were free under slavery because that made their blood work better. And that, those basic concepts are still, it still exists today. And so you're, you know, to move that is hard, but they're, to answer your question, <laughs> there, I think there are, people are working on this, and they see the problem now, um, and uh, some, you know, and, but it's just a, it's, it's a lot of, of um, deeply embedded ways of thinking and practice that have to be moved. Yeah. So Dorothy, um, thank you. This is wonderful work. My mind is so blown I'm having a hard time really formulating the question. <laughs> um, uh, I'll start with just um, how, how fascinating I think it is that um, the dichotomies that we've seen in race consciousness versus color blindness, mm -hmm. for example, in constitutional law. So mm -hmm. we have to be colorblind when it comes to social hierarchy, right. affirmative action, blah, right. blah, blah, but we have to be race conscious when it comes to faith and fighting crime. Um, right. Because right. that's real. Right. <laughs> so seeing now its yes. uh, amplification in this field I think is fascinating. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to think about the connections between yeah. the two. So, um, so that's just got my mind going crazy. Yeah. But the, the other thing, you might have mentioned it before I came, so I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I'm asking you, but I'm, I'm really curious about the structure of response. Like, the, like you said, Wade's response was, I'm not a racist <laughs> because White people just have more good stuff. Right, right. I didn't do it. Right. God did it. 
right. or someone else did. I mean, right. the, 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 the yeah. fact that that's a response is so. It made me wonder. So, what what are some of the other things that people say that reveal how narrow their understanding of racism is? Yes. So, so as I'm, so yes. you know, when you were just thinking back about slave science and stuff yeah. like that, like so. How do they distinguish this discourse from phrenology, for example? I mean, what do they say? Because yeah, right. no one was defending that anymore. Right. But was it, well, they were just measuring the wrong thing, right? So it's not wow. the circumference of the head. It's stuff that was inside, and they didn't have the ability to that's actually measure process. the stuff that's inside. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> is, it, is it sort of, that's like way too, you know, elementary, but it's, there's, deeper stuff. Because we yes. thought when you know you're rejecting the science of racial hierarchy, yes. you're rejecting the whole thing. The whole thing. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, no, no. It's just the wrong measurement. So yeah, what are they saying? Yeah, all oh, those are great They're very insightful questions because you really <laughs> took your finger on exactly what goes on in these arguments. So one, let me just say something about, you know, when this dichotomy, where is race important, where isn't it? And um, you know, not important in society, so we don't need it further the back. Important in crime, but it's interesting, even, even without getting to the genetics of it, there is a sense that race is important in crime. And you know, they criminologists use race as a variable to predict, to predict recidivism. Uh, you know. I'm going to try not to name too many names. <laughs> Go on, you've already started. <laughs> they, they use it, and, and I think there was, I think I read recently a judge that threw out a conviction where, Beth, you were saying, wasn't there a judge that threw out a conviction where the, the evidence that the defendant was going to commit future crimes was his race. Oh, so, but this is, this is considered a legitimate variable. In there are people whose whole career is around refining this way of using race to predict, and then it gets used against people to keep them in prison or to return them to prison. Okay, so but notice that that idea that race is important to crime is then shored up by an idea that there are race cause, uh, gene, gene, that genes cause crime, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, people put this equation together, oh, genes are different <laughs> by race, and genes cause crime, and black people make up most, most of the people in prison, so therefore, they must be committing crime because they're genetically predisposed to it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that leads to, well, if you're black, then you must be genetically predisposed to committing crime. Now, of course, we could challenge even the logic of all of that, but that's how many people think, including the people that are doing, you know, using race this way to predict, to make these predictions. Okay, then, um, what do you do about the fact that we have this long history of using innate ideas about race to promote racism and white supremacy. And we can see it as a justification for a whole slew of genocides and exterminations. Well, what's interesting is, number one, what you were saying, oh, but they were doing the science. Their science was flawed. Ours is perfected because we have genetic knowledge now. So um, <laughs> the phrenology will reject it, but if we can determine it by genes, then it's accurate. So that's one argument. We're doing it more accurately than they did it in the past. But that wouldn't be good enough because, as you're pointing out, it's the very ideology of it that has caused these harms. So you have to separate yourself from the ideology. And in a very
very perverse way, it's the very extreme violence that this ideology has, <laughs> I think, has justified that then a lot of people say, oh, but we're not like that. Therefore, we should be able to continue doing this kind of research. So Wade does that. Wade has a whole chapter on eugenics. You know, and but he says, but don't, we don't practice that anymore. You know, like the quote I show, that the, the quote I show where they say, that we're in a liberal democracy, but you know, they forget we're in a liberal democracy when eugenics was practiced in the United States. But that's the, it's a, it's a really strange way of saying, okay, we, it's almost, we recognize the harms, you know, the huge harms that this ideology caused in the past, so therefore we have to make extra effort to show that we are beyond causing those harms. It, it's, it's, a, it's straight, instead of saying we have, fundamentally it's the same ideology, therefore it could lead to similar harms today, it's, no, we're, we're different. You know, it's that though those people were white supremacists and Nazis. We're not white supremacists and Nazis, so therefore we can do the same type of research. <laughs> that, I mean, that's that's the kind of argument that's made, and the, and and then they will also say, and look, not only am I not a white supremacist or a Nazi, I am a member of this organization that supports civil rights, or I have this program where I am. Um, training uh, students of color. You know, so I would have the credentials to show you that I'm not like those people. And so that's, those are the kinds of arguments that are made. I know you had your hand up. It's okay. Oh, we have the, oh, we are.